as humans, we're actually not very good at perceiving the level of the very small, the stuff from which we come. And we're also not very good at perceiving the very large, the cosmos, the reality in which we're embedded. Instead, we're, we're trapped on this very thin slice in between at the level of rabbits and trees and mates and food and stuff like that. That's where we perceive reality. But the thing that I want to tell you about is that even at that layer, we're not very good at perceiving most of what's out there. So, so just take as an example the colors of our world. So this is electromagnetic radiation that bounces off things and hits your eyes. And you just open your eyes and you see the world. But it turns out that visible light is actually less than a 10 billionth of the electromagnetic spectrum. All the rest of the stuff is also light. It's just that you don't come with the proper receptors to be able to see it. And so it's completely invisible to you. So radio waves and microwaves and gamma rays and cosmic rays, all this stuff is passing through your body. And because you don't have the proper receptors for it, it's completely invisible to you. Um, it turns out that it doesn't, it's not inherently unseeable because other animals can see this. So, for example, rattlesnakes see in the infrared range and honeybees see in the ultraviolet range. And, of course, we build machines in the dashboards of our cars to see in the radio range. We build machines in hospitals to see in the x-ray range and so on. But all of this is invisible to you. There are thousands of cell phone conversations passing right through your body right now, and you have no idea because you don't have the proper biological receptors for it. Okay, so what this means, I think, is something that's a little counterintuitive, which is that your perception of reality is actually constrained by your biology. So you open your eyes and you think, oh, there's the world, but you're only seeing just a little bit of what's going on. And when you look across the animal kingdom, you find that different animals pick up on different parts of reality. So in the blind and deaf world of the tick, its signals are, uh, you know, temperature and butyric acid. That's what it's picking up on. For the black ghost knife fish, it's picking up on perturbations in electrical fields. For the blind echolocating bat, it's picking up on on air compression waves that are returning to it. That's the part of reality that they see. And the interesting part is, presumably, they think that's the entire objective reality out there. Because why would you ever stop to think that there's something beyond what you could see? So, so we have a word for this in science. It's called the Umwelt. And the Umwelt represents, it's the German word for the surrounding world. And it represents the little slice of your ecosystem that you're picking up on and that you presumably take to be the entire reality out there. So let's do a consciousness razor on this. So imagine that you're a, a bloodhound dog. So you've got this very long snout with 200 million scent receptors in it. And your whole world is about smell. You've got uh, slits in the side of your nostrils so that you can take big nosefuls of air. You've got floppy ears that are kicking up molecules. Everything for you is about, is about smell. And one day, you stop in your tracks with a revelation, and you look at your human master, and you think, what is it like to have the pitiful, impoverished nose of a human like, what would it be to not be able to tell that there's a cat 100 yards away or that, or that your best friend was on this very spot six hours ago? But because we're humans, we're used to our umwelt. We're stuck in our umwelt, and we're perfectly happy there. So what I'm interested in as a neuroscientist is this question of how is technology going to expand our umwelt? How's that going to change the way that we can experience the world? So many of you probably know that there are hundreds of thousands of people walking around with artificial hearing and artificial vision. And the way this works is you stick a microphone in and you feed the digital signal with a little electrode strip into the ear and people can come to hear. Or you take a little video camera and you feed the digital signal in to an electrode grid that's plugged into the retina and people can come to see. But the interesting part is, as recently as sort of 15, 18 years ago, there were lots of people who thought this was never going to work. And the reason is these digital technologies speak the dialect of Silicon Valley, 
but it's, it, that doesn't match your natural sense organs. It's not exactly the same as what your brain is used to receiving. So people thought the brain's never going to figure it out. But what happened is there's no problem. The brain has no problem figuring it out. It just takes the information in, figures out what to do with it, and it hears or it sees. Now, how do we understand that? Well, the trick is your brain isn't seeing or hearing any of this. Your brain is locked in silence and darkness inside the vault of your skull. And all it ever sees are these electrochemical signals. And that's it. Nothing more. You have this data that comes in along different data cables that we label, you know, visual information and auditory and touch and so on. But this is all the brain ever sees. What it's really good at doing is extracting patterns and figuring things out and putting together a story and putting together this, your version of, you know, your subjective world with all its colors and sounds and so on. But it's all happening in here. Now, the thing that I really want to emphasize is your brain doesn't know and it doesn't care where the data come from. All it ever knows is that it's receiving different things along different cables and that's it. And it just figures out what to do with it. Now, this has led me to propose a new uh, theory about brain function, which I call the pH model of evolution. I don't want to get too technical, but pH stands for potato head. And the idea is that all these peripheral receptors that we know and love, like our eyes and our ears and our nose and our mouth and our fingertips, this is all just plug-and-play peripheral devices. There's nothing special about these. It's what we've inherited from a long road of evolution. But the idea is, once Mother Nature has figured out the principles of brain operation, she can just plug in whatever peripheral device she wants, and the brain figures out what to do with that information. And when we look across the animal kingdom, we see lots of peripheral devices. So snakes have these heat pits by which they can detect infrared. And the black ghost knifefish, which I mentioned before, has these electroreceptors. The star-nosed mole has this nose with 22 fingers on it with which it feels around in, in dark tunnels and constructs a three-dimensional version of its world. And uh, lots of birds and cows and insects have magnetite by which they can orient to the magnetic orientation of the, of the planet. So there's lots of plug-and-play peripheral detectors that can be put in here. And the idea is Mother Nature doesn't need to reinvent the brain every time to, to, to learn it. Instead, the right way to think about the brain is that it's a general-purpose computational device. And whatever data you feed in, it just figures out what to do with it. So the lesson that surfaces here is this issue about how there's nothing particularly special about what we have. It's, you know, it's just what we have inherited, but, but my assertion is that it's not what we have to stick with. And I think our best proof of principle for that comes from what's known as sensory substitution, which is the idea of feeding in information to the brain via unusual sensory channels. Now, this might sound speculative, but the first demonstration of this was published in the journal Nature in 1969. So a scientist named Paul Bakke Rita took blind people and he put them in a modified dental chair and uh, he set up a video camera and he would wiggle something in front of the camera and whatever was in front of the camera got poked into your back via this grid of solenoids. So these are people who are totally blind and if you put a coffee cup in front of the camera, you feel the coffee cup in your back. Or if you put a face or a triangle or whatever it is, you feel it. And blind people were surprisingly good at being able to tell what was going on. They, they learned how to do that, and they got good at that. And there have been many modern incarnations of this. So, for example, th these are the sonic glasses where you have a video feed, and whatever's being seen gets turned into... Uh, an auditory landscape. So as you're moving around the world, you hear and at first it sounds like a cacophony and you're banging your shin into things. But pretty soon, you get pretty good at this. Blind people, completely blind, get pretty good at understanding their visual world through sound. And it doesn't have to be through the ears. This version is an uh, electrotactile grid on the forehead. 
Why the forehead? Because you're not using it for anything else. And so the video feed gets turned into a little poking on your forehead. And blind people can get really good at understanding what's out in front of them in the world. Um, this is the most modern incarnation. It's called the, the brain port. And the idea is that whatever the camera is seeing, you feel it on this little electrotactile grid on your tongue. So it feels like pop rocks. And blind people get so good at this that they can do things like throw a ball into a basket or navigate a complex obstacle course just by feeling it on their tongue. Now, if it sounds crazy to be able to see through your tongue... Just remember that that's all vision ever is. All vision ever is is electrochemical signals getting to the brain. The brain doesn't know how it gets there. It just knows that it has this information that correlates with what it can feel and what it bumps into and so on, and that's what it learns on, and that's why people can do this. So in my lab, we got very interested in this issue about sensory substitution for the deaf. And along with my graduate student, Scott Novick, we decided to set out to build something so that deaf people could have sensory substitution. So the idea is, if someone says something, we wanted to build this thing in the middle so that a completely deaf person would have no problem understanding what was being said. And we wanted to build it on you know, uh, current technology like cell phones, and we wanted to have it be completely unobtrusive, something that people could uh, wear and, um, and wear it under their clothes. So unlike the tongue grid, it could be something that was, uh, you know, not seen at all. So here's the idea. Um, the idea is <clears throat> um, what I have is this, uh, this phone here, and I'm, and I'm translating the sounds of what, I'm f of what is being said into a pattern of vibrations. And then what's happening is I'm wearing this vest, and the vest translates the patterns of vibration, so it translates the auditory sounds into patterns of vibration so that I'm actually feeling what is being said. So I'm translating the auditory world around me into these patterns that I can feel on my torso. So we've been testing this. We've been testing this with deaf people for, um, for a little while now. And here's just one example. This is Jonathan. He's... Uh, 37 years old, has a master's degree, born totally deaf. So there's a portion of his umwelt that's totally unavailable to him. So we, t we put him in the vest for an hour a day for four days, and here he is on the fifth day. You. So Scott says the word you, and Jonathan is feeling the pattern of vibrations on his vest. Where? Where? So Scott says the word where? Jonathan, just by taking this pattern of vibrations, can figure out what is being said, and he writes touch. it on the board. Touch. So Scott says the word touch, and Jonathan writes it. So, so that's the idea. And, and, and the pattern of vibrations is too complicated for Jonathan to be doing this consciously because the frames are coming every 20 milliseconds. It's not that he's consciously translating. It's that he's, he's learning the vest just the way that you learn how to hear with your inner ear which is to say you're just picking up on, on these patterns and you're correlating and you're figuring out what to make of them. Now, the key with this is that we can build this vest for very cheap. So, uh, you know, several hundred dollars, we can build the vest. And, and the only thing that can, that can cure deafness currently is a cochlear implant. And that's about $100,000 and an invasive surgery. So this opens up a cure for deafness for those who want it to the entire world. And so this is what we're moving to do is get this all around the planet very rapidly. So that's what we're doing with deafness. Thank you. Thank you. So here's the thing that got me really interested is, is beyond deafness, could we use this type of technology to feed other kinds of information directly into the vest? Could you develop a perception of something brand new that hasn't traditionally been a part of the human umwelt? So just as an example, here's a subject in our lab who is wearing the vest. He's feeling a random, he, he's feeling a pattern of data that's being fed to him from the internet. It's not random, it's from the net. He's presented with two buttons, a yellow and a blue button, and he chooses one. And he gets feedback, either a frowny face or a smiley face. He doesn't know what, what is going on. But what we're doing is we're feeding real-time stock market data. And he's making buy and sell decisions. 
And we're learning whether he can be plugged in to the economic movements of the planet and can develop that as part of his umwelt if he can understand the financial movements of what's going on. Um, Twitter, we're experimenting with Twitter. So let's say I'm picking up on every single tweet with this hashtag in it, and you pick up on thousands of these, and you can feel in real time, because we can do a sentiment analysis and know whether uh, positive or negative or neutral things are being said. Imagine if you were a politician and giving a speech, and you could feel everything about the, the whole community that's hearing it, the 1.5 million people that are hearing it, all at once, you're feeling it, uh, and, and that, that taps you into a completely new part of the umwelt that humans have never been in. Um, weather data. So if, if you're feeling the weather data from the surrounding 200 miles, the question is, could you develop a, a different kind of experience? Um, drug dogs. Instead of having a drug dog, we're working on setting up a molecular detector and being able to feel that so you can replace the dog. We're doing this with prosthetics. People with prosthetic legs actually have a hard time learning how to walk because they have to look at their leg all the time because they're not getting feedback from it. So we just take the, you know, the pressure and angle data and we feed it into the, the person that way. We're experimenting with drone pilots where, in this case, the pilot is feeling the pitch, yaw, roll, orientation, and heading of the drone as he's flying around such that it's like extending his skin up there. And as a result of this, drone pilots can learn how to fly at nighttime, in fog, anything like that, because they're feeling their drone instead of merely watching it. And, and the next step for us is figuring out how to do this with, you know, this is a modern airplane cockpit. There are so many gauges and things to look at. What if you could feel that data instead of having to look at it? Because the fact is that the human visual system is really good at certain things like blobs and edges and movement, but it's not good at taking in multidimensional data. And that's why you have to crawl the scene one thing at a time to understand what's going on with it. So there's a difference between having access to big data and experiencing it. And this is where we're moving. We're trying things with factories where you have hundreds of machines. What if you can feel the state of the factory and know when things are normal versus something is going a little off? You can feel it instead of having to look at uh, all the, the displays. And, you know, the general story is we're moving into this world of big data. And so our goal is to allow people to experience this. And, you know, I think there's no limit on the horizon as far as where this can go. So just imagine being able to see in infrared or ultraviolet or have 360-degree vision or be tapped into the invisible states of your body, like the health of your microbiome and your blood pressure and so on. You're, you're feeling, you're experiencing all that or feeling that of someone else's, being able to be tapped into their physiology and have that experience. One of the things I'm interested in doing next is getting this onto the International Space Station to the astronauts because they spend a lot of their time floating around looking at little monitors to see the, the health of the space station. But what if you could just feel that? So the bottom line is that we no longer have to wait for Mother Nature's sensory gifts on, on her time scale because instead, like any good parent, what she's given us are the cognitive tools to go out and define our own future. So the question now is, how do you want to experience your universe? Thank you very much.